All right, so um, just a really, really brief introduction before we uh, head straight onto the papers because we have a pretty um, uh, busy uh, panel today. Um, so welcome to the second session for climate development and the politics of participation. Um, I guess I, most of us were here yesterday, but for those of you who are unable to make the first session, perhaps for the sake of the recording, um, the panel itself, it's been organized by myself, Dr. John Enser, Dr. Richard Friend and Dr. Arabella Fraser. Um, and the impetus for convening uh, these sessions um, have been largely two GCRF uh, projects, uh, political capability, uh, equitable uh, political capabilities, rectable resilience, um, should know this by now, and uh, tomorrow Cities Hub. Um, so these, uh, both these projects have looked uh, quite broadly at issues around climate, uh, urban risk, uh, and the politics of development. And with kind of COVID, and the systemic uncertainties that has been brought about uh, by the crisis. Um, there's been an increasing alignment around issues or longstanding issues rather of participation or participatory development. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to bring a panel together so each team could share what they've learned over the course of the project so far and to kind of foster broader discussions um, and connections beyond each of the respective projects. So yeah, so without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, the first uh, set of speakers uh, to present. So Dr. Um, uh, Anusha Shrestha um, is a postdoctoral research associate at the South Asia Institute of Advanced Studies uh, based in Kathmandu. She holds a PhD in social science from Wageningen University in the, ne in the Netherlands. Um, and the second speaker, um, Dr. Dilly Padel, um, holds a PhD in human geography from the Department of Geography at the University of Bergen in Norway. Um, he's also a co-conspirator on Paul Caps along with Anusha. Um, and he is a senior research, uh, researcher also at SIAS based in Kathmandu. So I would like to invite both of you to uh, take the floor. I just remind everyone uh, during the course of the presentations if we could just have our, our, our screens off just to uh, preserve bandwidth, that'd be great. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Bobby. Uh Good morning, good afternoon to everyone, and I'll, I will move to the slide now. Thank you. Uh, starting with what we are discussing about, uh, Polcap, particularly Polcap project, we are looking into urban uh, marginality issue, and in this particular presentation, how uh, urban infrastructures are uh, circumventing the marginalities and how they are contesting against uh, their exclusion from uh, overall government planning processes. So moving into it, what is urban infrastructure in Nepal? Urban infrastructure in Nepal are referred to as Sukumbasi. So there are two categories. In general, Sukumbasi refers to those who do not have land in any part of the country. But uh, in the urban context, the urban informal settlers, along with their representatives and advocates, opponents, <clears throat> have been uh, advocating that in uh, informal settlers in urban context are is residing on any on, unauthorized space, while they may still have land elsewhere in the country, are informal settlers. So regarding status, it's not very clear what is their population, what is their status. But uh, based on our interviews, we uh, we got information that they are around 40 lakh of settlers in, in Nepal, as per the government record, whereas informal settlers claim that it is 70, 50 lakhs, whereas in some other interviews, they also claim it's 70 lakhs. So basically, there's no clarity on what is their population and what is their status. And in Kumandu Valley, uh, it was 64 settlements in years ago, uh, around mid early 2000, but they got a number of settlements, got set, resettled in the outskirts of Kathmandu. So now it is around 52 or 54. Again, we do not know what is the exact number. And among those, some are uh, riparian, many are riparian, and among those, some are they claim to be safe, whereas the government claims all the riparian settlements are risk prone. So the major defining criteria is they do not have land rights, land formal land title. So because of that, they are they become informal, and government has been discouraging them as illegal settlement. And more recently, they are the areas where the settlement exist, particularly in the riparian areas, they are delineated as risk areas. These are few pictures of informal settlements in Kathmandu Valley. The first two along the river. These are uh, these. Even the informal settlers agree these are risk prone areas and need to be relocated. Whereas the last one, this is also a riparian settlement, but as per the government uh, by law, which sets 20 meters uh, um, guideline from the uh, river bank, 
So this lies beyond, out of that. While the government considers these areas should be open space, the informal settlers claim that it's not just informal settlers who have been occupying these areas. There are also, as we see, these are not just informal settlers, there are also big buildings for our formal settlers. So these are not um, risk prone areas, and the informal settlers in such areas should be relocated where they exist. What is our research question? Our, our ultimate aim is to understand how informal settlers are contesting in contesting uh, in this informal to formal transition processes and are bringing their issues and and how it's advocating for their rights. So in this, we are you on we are focusing on what different knowledge infrastructures have they been using, how they draw from those, and and how they use this. But very recent, I will uh, I will discuss this later in the following slides. But government also has um, new policies which is very much it apparently looks inclusive in terms of um, informal settlers management so but despite this are they really capacitating informal settlers or are they bringing new constraints so this is also our focus here so the base method is based on the view of policy documents side by side with the review and we have also started conducting interviews but because of pandemic it's largely virtual interviews with informal settlers the representatives and government authorities with government authorities, we are yet to start. And it has been quite challenging to interact with also those uh, informants, which we could, it was also not easy. We built on our one of the relation of one of our partners, Lumanti, which is the pioneer of, um, which has been advocating for rights of informal settlers from almost last two decades. And building on that relation, we could interview them, but still they were very hesitant in sharing a number of information which could have been very useful for us. So we hope to improve the relation in the following time and get also understand those issues. But on the, the pandemic also has been a major issue here. Uh, sometimes the researchers, we ourselves were infected while our respondents also were infected. So we had to wait for them to uh, get better to get in the interviews. At the same time, many of our inter uh, respondents are also involved in the management of COVID. So it's very difficult to get their time also for the virtual interviews. So we will be conducting for the interviews. So it's an ongoing process, and the interviews have really recently started. And explaining about the policy, discussing the policy context. The basic context is now assess the authenticity of informal settlers based on the criteria that government has set, and accelerate the informal formal transition process. And in this, it is basically focused on whether they have land and right land elsewhere or not. This, based on this, there are two categories of informal settlers. The first one, Bumi and Sukubasi, we do not have land in any part of the country, but over the years with the informal settlers and the representatives advocating for their rights, the government has now finally accepted that land elsewhere, land having ownership of land is not made a determinant of whether the settler is informal or not. So it also recognizes that landlessness is not mandatory to be recognized for as an informal settler. At the same time, the constitution has also recognized right to housing as a fundamental right. So, and recently building on this new amendment, recent amendment, which was done in 2020 of the Land Related Act, the government has formed new commission, but this is not an, uh, the only commission. There have been almost 21 or uh, 21 commissions formed in the past, uh, but this, the government also said that this is more uh, inclusive in, and, and more likely to solve the issue there. They're also hopeful because all year government used to form it in a number of uh, districts, whereas others were included, whereas this time the there are 77 districts in Nepal and the commission has its panel in all 77 districts. So they also are hopeful that this issue will be, uh, will get addressed at least a bit more. And the forced eviction is against the constitution. The constitution has also accepted force uh, against the constitutional rights. But again here, ownership becomes a determinant of where the informants have right to their settlement or their housing or not. And also the Land Related Amendment Act has outlined the areas, the locations where the land cannot be provided to informal settlers. I will discuss this for them later. And focusing in Kathmandu Valley, where we have focused our study, the Bagmati Action Plans, this was formed between 2009 and 2014, but it's still functional. We have high committee for the Bagmati River Improvement. And these action plans, states that riparian informal settlements have to be removed uh, to save the civilization of Kathmandu Valley and improve the urban environment. And also the Kathmandu Valley Development Authority, which is the formal authority for development of Kathmandu Valley, has formed risk-sensitive land use plan. And this 
and also delineates these areas uh, along riverbanks areas as risk areas and, and it should not be these areas should not be utilized for any other spaces than uses than um, open spaces and QVDA has also formed a long term strategic development master plan which aims that with individuals there will be no informal settlements by 2035 in the vulnerable areas but this vulnerable areas is not well defined it's it could be the risk areas where it has delineated from the risk sensitive land use plan and there have been two um, basic approach of government relocation, which has been very few. One is of Kitipur housing, which was done in 2003, and largely eviction, though, as I mentioned, it is against the constitution. The evictions have not stopped. And, and, and lately, the discourse of risk on nature of informal settlers is increasingly used to legitimize uh, resettlement, also eviction. Although resettlement because of uh, the eviction which was done in 2012 for it, the uh, government was very much criticized based on this. Formally, it has shifted to uh, relocation is, is said to be priority, but eviction, as I mentioned, has not stopped. And in terms of formal, uh, formal participation, informal sectors, their uh, political capabilities, if we see in terms of uh, socioeconomic position uh, and social, uh, social acceptance, as well as political participation in the socio-political governance space, uh, this has relatively improved over the last two decades. They have formally re uh, re registered federations which have been advocating for their rights, particularly while in the past it was access to municipal services. Over the years, land rights, the formal land title is their major priority and major demand. And these cooperatives which have as I mentioned, they have very much contributed to improve their economic status, entrepreneurship skills, uh, which also has contributed to gain the social acceptance and have distributed family IDs, but these are only for all settlers. This, uh, this was done around early 2000 and distributed to settlements who settled prior to 1999. So new settlements do not have these cards and ID cards are used to uh, access, this is considered is even considered by the formal authorities, lo the local government particularly, to provide access to uh, public services such as water, electricity. And they have able to, able to expand their linkages with government authorities at different levels, particularly at the local level, also the elected representatives. And with multiple political parties, so as to not get, so as to gain protection against eviction, even if there are changes in the ruling party. And land commissions they also have been able to establish relations with land commissions, particularly with the current one. They claim that they have very good relations and are in frequent uh, regular communication with the commission commissioner head. Um, and also with national and international organizations, uh, which have provided them, which have helped them in accessing municipal services, also as to pressurize the government to address informality issues. And these, um, while they use uh, get municipal services in the short term, this they preserve their um, this, uh, receipt as to use it as a basis to, to to use it where if there are evictions or any other process where they need to provide formal documents. And regarding their participation in the land uh, related amendment act, we see that they do not they were not directly involved. They were not in the table talk, but they had drafted a bill with uh, Lumanti and UDBC. Uh, we are yet to confirm when was that and when did that Anisha, happen. Hi, Anisha. Sorry, you have about five minutes left. Okay, okay, I will finish that. Thank you. And they have included this. They claim that their suggestions have been largely addressed. This uh, Land Amendment Act, they were able to put their views in the Amendment Act. And as I mentioned, the, this risk narrative has been a major determinant in case of Kathmandu Valley in determining relocation eviction. And the, this federation uh, itself have, they also have formed and formulated policy incorporating this risk aspect where they say because some settlements have matched to the government from a setback of 20 meters and not risking. and in some areas they were also able to um, for example move high tension line to turn our risk prone areas into safe areas along with the local government and as i mentioned um, they have strengthened their linkages with uh, multiple level of government authorities as well as international organizations and they have been lobbying for their rights but yet Despite that the new policy is inclusive, it has also brought new risks. For example, this Land Related Amendment Act clearly states that religious, cultural, public land, risk, uh, river banks, risk prone areas, and forest areas, etc., cannot be provided to the informal settlers. Whereas if we see informal settlers as largely located in these areas, while it looks very much inclusive, that if 
if the government takes, starts managing, these former settlers will not be provided any compensation or alternative. Because they are in risk areas or the prohibited areas. And while they have good relations, they have also been building on the fundamental right, land right. But here they have added the shelter with land rights. So basically their target is land rights. But despite all these influences, political capabilities that has increased over the years and their good linkages with the political parties where they mobilize their vote. As I mentioned, the population is not clear. This is also, we, we believe, we think that this might also be politics of number, that they want to issue, stress the severity of the issue, but at the same time also attract or, or entice the politicians about the number of votes that can be, that they can get if they, the politician or the parties address these issues. So while the strength, the capability seems to be including, have been improving, they're also clear that politicians also do not want to solve the issues and they continue being exploited. So that has been one more risk for them. Thank you. This was my last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anusha. There we go. Thank you very much, Anusha. Um, so I think I, as we kind of had planned, we'll, we'll take uh, questions as a whole at the end, once everyone has had a chance to present. Um, so please save up any questions you might have or throw them into the, into the chat function um, for each of the presenters. Um, is Oriel about? Um, I think we are missing Oriel. Shall we just, um, shall we just okay. move on to Barbara? Um, Barbara, are you, are you ready to present? Yeah. Um, Okay, um, let me see here. <laughs> um, well, you have your bio, so everyone can see your bio as well. Okay, uh, welcome, uh, Barbara. You're, Barbara is a PhD student in the International Development at the University of Reading. Um, she has over 10 years of experience working in the private sector in Malawi, coordinating climate change, adaptation programs, adaptation programs, food security, and humanitarian programs. Okay, Barbara, the floor is yours, and just let me know when you'd like me to change um, the slides. All right, yeah. Thank you, everyone. And I'm um, Barbara, as she has already said. I'll be presenting on the stakeholders and allied control over environmental and just resettlement. And this is a case study of Malawi. Yeah, uh, globally, the occurrence of flooding is, is common nowadays, and the various mitigation and adaptation measures have been put in place, and one of them is resettlement. And the uh, settlement is in terms of flooding is actually moving the people from the flood prone areas to higher areas which are deemed safe. Uh, however, this has been a political process. Hence, it's considered as the last resort. And to ensure effective implementation of resettlement, people centered approaches have been adopted, which means people need to be part and part of the resettlement program. And the evidence suggests that. Uh, participation empowers communities and ensures sustainable resettlement. However, uh, community participation is not only consulting or informing uh, the resettlers that there is this resettlement program and you need to move, but uh, being part and parcel of the process like when, how, and the where to move. Yeah, so in terms of uh, community participation model, uh, it ensures that uh, all is, uh, the private sector, the host community where the people are to be resettled, but also the public sector, including the flood victims, need to be part and parcel of the process in terms of the planning and designing of the resettlement program, economic development of what are the things that need to be done at the, uh, the second uh, community but also monitoring and evaluation of the process to see what are the benefits and the, the advantages of moving if the other things to be changed, but also beneficial identification. If it's not uh, moving the whole community and it's uh, just identifying few individuals to move first and to be helped by the private sector, this needs to be participated. Yeah, next slide. Yeah. So who are the allies in terms of resettlement? Yeah, so we are describing a group of people, individuals which have high influence in the community, but also in the resettlement process. And these people 
they often make decisions on behalf of the receptors as a result, uh, make, making the resettlement to be top-down approach, despite that most of the time it's been labeled as participatory. So it has been observed that the government and the, the NGOs most of the times who are doing the resettlement program and the local allies have more influence than the resettlers themselves. And in developing countries, mostly they are the traditional leaders have been entrusted with the resettlement decision processes. So although this could have a positive impact, but it hugely suppresses the resettlers' voices because as you're putting in those people who have high power in the community, those people who are marginalized, they cannot talk against the decisions that have been made. So this could result in different movement dynamics. Some people can visit the resettlement program. Others can choose uh, to be moving back and forth or to go back after being resettled. So in terms of my case study in Malawi, yeah, can you move to the next one? Yeah, so this case study, my research, I, I conducted it in Malawi in four traditional authorities from the two districts, the southern region part of Malawi. And these districts were chosen because they are prone to flooding each and every year. And um, since the 1960s, this area has been experiencing flooding, however, from the years 2000, as it is in all the globe, the flooding has been rampant. And the, the government has been trying to resettle the people from this area to higher areas, either within the same communities, but also outside their communities. However, this resettlement program has been faced with resistance because of a number of issues. And the, one of the issues is that the people living in this area, 90% of them are farmers, and they depend on the same flood plain for their livelihood. But also the idea of being home, that this is where I belong, and also the social network. So it has blurred the resettlement program in Malawi. And the, it was learned that the local leaders still help the resettlement program. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, so what are the roles of the airlines in resettlement in Malawi? It was, in my research, I found out that most of the crucial parts of the resettlement programming were left in the hands of the local airlines in the community. So the government and the implementing partners, the NGOs that were still heading the resettlement, where most of the times in contact with the local elects, which are the traditional leaders, sidelining the people that needed to be resettled themselves. So the local leaders were the ones who are being interested with site selection, where the people to be resettled, and the local leaders were negotiating the land process, where which land should the people reset and where should they go. And the, this, in the end result, it ended up people deserting the resettlement program because this is not what they desired. So in terms of beneficial selection, uh, the local leaders, of course, they know who are the vulnerable people are in the community, but this led to some conflict because uh, people are able to say that only the people who are close to the traditional leaders were the ones who were given nice areas, but also in other places, people wanted to move as a community or they wanted to move as a family. But because this process was laid somewhere, people could not give out their ideas and only the elderly were the ones which, which were prioritized. So going, leaving their family behind and going somewhere, it looked to be challenging. And also the decision whether to reset or not was made by the local airlines based on their benefits, their perceived benefits of the resettlement, mainly to do if they will resettle, whether they will continue to maintain their airline position like traditional leaders, or when they mix in other communities, this will not, this privilege will not be there. 
So based on this understanding, you could choose whether people should resettle or not in the process, making the vulnerable people to be more vulnerable. So according to my research, the resettler needed not only the physical resources, but also non-physical resources. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So the researchers mainly wanted their place dependence in which I mean uh, the researchers need for land, for farming, but also the river, which they are using for fishing, which is one of their main source of livelihood, and they are already established business sources. So as you can see from the pictures, the picture to your right, the first one is the same. These pictures were taken at the same period. The other one is the dry land where the people they want to be resettled. While the next picture is in the lower land where they need to move, while the people were utilizing the land there uh, to plant their crops. So you could see that people already, they are already thinking about their livelihood. And the, the another thing was the researchers' social connections, which are to do with their family, their neighbors, but also their social networks where they depend on their everyday life. And the other issue was to do with the researchers' place identity, which mainly to do with the, to be in their forefathers' land. And the, apart from that, the researchers were thinking about the non-movable resources, which are mainly like the graveyard. So using the participatory mapping and the photographs, people were able to come up with pictures of the things that they think that they are very relevant for them, so that before they move, they need to discuss further on how basic these things can be taken into consideration into their, uh, where they are moving or before they leave. So one of the great issues was the issue of the graveyards for their forefathers. So people are saying that we are born in this area and we are raised here and our forefathers were buried in this area. So we don't see the need for us to move to different places while leaving our forefathers. And the, it was further said that this is their source of blessing. So if they leave, it means all their blessings that they have, it will be taken away from them. So they wanted this to be incorporated in the resettlement program. And the, some people, they say, I, I don't feel to blame uh, that I belong to this place, meaning the destination area. Because when they went there, there were issues like uh, the host community were sidelining these people and calling them names, and people were not able to cope. So because of these things, people were saying that I think Although I'm vulnerable in the lower area, but I need to go to where I belong, where I'm respected, and where my forefathers are, and where I'm able to get whatever I'm used to. But all this settles to the issue of participation in the process. So as according to my findings, this process to factor in the non-tangible resources in terms of resettlement was not included in the resettlement program. So in conclusion, yeah, next slide. Um, I'm, I'm saying that the resettlement was not only top down, but it did not consider both tangible and non-tangible resources. So in, according to the interviews that I had with the key informants both from the NGOs and also the government, the resettlement program was termed as voluntary, but also as a bottom up whereby the people were able to conceptualize their own resettlement program, like where to move and when to move. Considering that they were talking with the local airlines we are able to decide uh, like to negotiate where they should move 
with their wherever they want to go. So this is the land that we want. So to the implementers, this was what stemmed as a voluntary resettlement, but also participation of the the vulnerable people. But in in essence, you could see that the most vulnerable people were sidelined. Hence, it resulted into uh, non. Uh, it resulted into these movements, which were not desirable in the resettlement program, like people uh, deserting the resettlement area and going back to the lower land where they belong. As a result, each and every year they are vulnerable. And when floods come again, they need the government need also to evacuate these people and to go upland. So these non-tangible resources are the ones that I'm talking about, like the, their identity, but also social connections. And um, of course, the land itself and the graves that they are talking about, and their, even their culture, their cultural values. So the allies, they were seen to play a crucial role in this resettlement program, but close monitoring of how power is executed is paramount. So we're not saying that the local allies, they, they should not be part and parcel of the process, but we need to monitor how they are using their power to sideline or to oppress the people that are to be resettled. So the vulnerable people themselves, they need to be given this platform that they can talk, they can conceptualize their own resettlement and to discuss further how best this can be incorporated in the resettlement policy and the programming to make sure that the, the desirable results of the resettlement has been reached. So I must say that people have diverse means, priorities, and problems. Hence, holistic approach ensures sustainability. So talking with the people to be resettled was seen to be a crucial issue rather than bringing in um, already conceptualized ideas which the people will accept in the short time saying that, okay, we're, we're going to resettle, but in the long run, they will end up uh, going back to, to their old places. So the resettlers responded by leaving the resettlement site, hence wasting donors or government resources. So as I said, if the model of participation in any resettlement program is not incorporated, people will respond in whatever way they want. So it, like in, in my case, there are some issues that people were able to, they accepted to move, but six months or one year into the, the resettlement program, whereby they have already been given land, the government and the donors have already built houses for these people. But because after staying there, they will notice that we don't have any land for us to continue with our life resources. People were able to go back to the resettlement site. In the long run, the government and the donors were calling these people adamant, and the, the people who just want to continue to be vulnerable and to be helped with them uh, donor support each and every year, like in relief items. But in the actual sense, if you deep, you, 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 you sit down with the people and you talk to them, they will tell you that uh, we are just being told that we, you need to move. But after moving, there was no any other support. We thought that government will come in and continue to give us, like to, de to develop a, a economical maybe to establish some business and also to continue with our farming. But this is not our life, so we need to go back to where we are used to and where we can find everything that we want. So the main picture here is that but federally of the vulnerable people, it's not just informing the people about the process, but incorporating them in each and every step of resettlement to make sure that both tangible and non-tangible resources are being incorporated when they are resettling people. Yeah, those are some of the 
materials that can be used. And uh, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks everyone for your attention. If Thank there you, are any, there are any comments or questions, yeah, we'll discuss in the session session. Thank you. Thank you. For, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, we're quite, uh, we're quite, uh, we're quite good for time at the moment. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Dilly. Are you there? Yes, I'm here, Bobby. Okay, Dilly, you have um, you have plenty of time in front of you. <laughs> um, I'd like to <laughs> welcome you uh, to uh, uh, take the floor. Um, I, I, I won't go ahead with a with an introduction because. Uh, We've already done that, and most of us already know who you are. So uh, whenever you're ready, Dilly, okay? Thank you, thank you. And thanks for giving me extra time. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, uh, DSA team and uh, this panel. Uh, for letting me to uh, give you time. Uh, well, uh, this is a part of uh, Tomorrow City project and funded by UK, UKRI and GCRF. And uh, I'm representing CS and uh, we, a couple of people are working this paper uh, uh, for Tomorrow City. Well, previously this, this uh, uh, paper was, I mean, that this, uh, the abstract was submitted with the, with the, with the name a thick policy by thin implementations, a study of uh, disaster risk governance in Nepal. Uh, but that we switch uh, because um, basically it's not a, a big difference uh, in terms of analyzing the risks. Well, previously we thought that uh, we will uh, go through the policies and how uh, well they have done and then, I mean, what uh, a good provision they have, either they are based on international document or not, those things we, we want to do at the first and uh, go down to the, uh, community and see how uh, well these uh, policies are implemented. But later we thought that, well, um, to do that, we, we, we have to work a lot only to say how good policy are. Instead of saying, uh, we decided to go down to the community level and uh, see what tricks are there and uh, what kind of risks they face in everyday life and how uh, local level uh, government and community manage those risks uh, or not manage those risks. Uh, and then we, then after, after having those kind of things and we can see up uh, at the uh, at the scale upper level and the municipal and the other policies and see uh, how well uh, the uh, these uh, policy were implemented or not and what are the gap there. The, we only flip the method actually. Uh, in general, we are, we are not uh, much difference uh, in terms of changing this, this uh, type well, uh, we we are referring uh, 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 to those uh, challenges and then shocks that are being produced uh, by you know, rapid urbanization that are going in Kafumi Valley and the existing uh, social political uh, inequality at local level, uh, and uh, which uh, which people differently face at community level based on their access to uh, economic uh, resources, information, institutions, and their position in society. And the people are not uh, same in terms of you know. Uh, in terms of handling risks or responding risks, and also uh, you know, when when they uh, when they need to face uh, challenges in those risks, so uh, there are different kinds of people at the community level. So particularly, we, uh, we we analyze how local government uh, that means municipality and uh, ward. Well, ward is the lowest uh, administrative unit of Nepal. Municipality. Uh, municipality ha one municipality can have several wards, so it's a, we went to the lowest at community level. There, how uh, they manage the risks that are being produced by, as I said before, uh, development intervention that are going on uh, at community level. I will talk more about this intervention later on. And also um, uh, due to um, uh, their social relation within the community, which are uh, which, which is based on the caste ethnicity and and and. Uh, mm, their access to uh, uh, local political affairs or economic development. Uh, particularly, uh, we uh, this uh, the object of this uh, piece of work is is to analyze how risks are being produced at community level and and how municipal local governments are set to function. So we, we can expose the gap between uh, risk management and uh, uh, risk management governance and actual risks uh, exist in local level. 
Well, this is this study is based on uh, the one small community of Kathmandu Valley. You can see. Well, I'll talk more about this study area later. But uh, you can you can see uh, where it located in within Kathmandu Valley in a green circle uh, in this map uh, on both uh, right and left map. And the right map is, is basically it says how Kathmandu is expanding uh, all all around this uh, black. Uh, let me choose the pointer. Okay, this this line, this uh, it's, it's called Ring Road, which is around, which is seventy kilometers long, and it's it's a main uh, Kathmandu city. Well, the main is still in the center, but uh, it's a more most crowded, crowded crowded part of the valley. But it's expanding all over actually, all around this circle actually. And the government has uh, the another plan to construct outer ring road. You can see the small map down there, uh, the blue the blue line. This outer ring road. It's not the government map, but uh, but it gives some tentative ideas idea how how this uh, going to happen the outer ring road. So this will going to cover whole part. So, but this, uh, the small area where I'll talk more later will also belong to this part. And uh, uh, there are other uh, uh, settlements, you know, uh, with uh, um, where the construction activities are going on and the city is expanding all over the area. Well, Kathmandu is around 890 square kilometer, you know, in terms of area, uh, which is surrounded by the, uh, about 1900 to 2000 meter tall mountain. And it's a, it's a, it's kind of a, a bowl, a, a bowl and the, the river comes from all parts and it's a small valley and crowded. Being a capital city, it's very crowded and migration is very high. So every car, every side beyond this thing is, uh, is uh, you know, people are constructing houses and there are several development activities and construction activities are going on. So it's it's already at risk. Uh, you know, you can see on the left side, it's a the, it, uh, several part of Kafu Valley is is liquefaction area where you know uh, all, always uh, they are always exposed to this. In addition to that, uh, whole Nepal is stand um, uh, you know. Um, uh, on on two uh, major uh, tectonic uh, 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 zone, uh, Indian and Eurasian tectonic plate, uh, which collide each other, and, uh, um, and that's why uh, the, the mountain Nepal mountain is is operating every year, which also creating risks of landslide and flood every year, and also uh, the risks of uh, earthquake. is very high. Uh, so that's the Kafun Valley is exposed to. Uh, Several leaks. It is exposed to natural hazard, the demographic and crowd and landslide and flood and traffic hazard. So it is exposed to multi hazard in a, in a single world. Uh, you can see that the same map on the right side. On the left side, you can see the the river system. It, it has only one outlet. The Bhagavad River is a trunk river, and there are other several rivers. You can see uh, coming from all around the, the valley, and it's it collected. Uh, it meets uh, all river meet at the center and go to go to go to southern world. And they see the coconut is the last place here, um, somewhere here, uh, uh, where this uh, river go out. So uh, this is also the reason we selected this place. Well, uh, this developer intervention, as I also mentioned, it has a spillover effect throughout the Kafun Valley, uh, from the center uh, throughout the periphery in our area. Uh, several custom activities are going on, and uh, and that, uh, and also there are lots of uh, real estate housing uh, going on. And uh, at the same time, it also. Um, uh, uh, due to these expansions, uh, the agricultural activities are decreasing, and that those people living uh, you know, around uh, around these um, peripheral area, they are traditional people, they are several traditional people, their culture and heritage are at risk, uh, as many people claim. The Kukana is one of one of such villages on the southern side where newer the community live. Where there are, uh, I have on the map, uh, I'll, show le I'll, I'll show later, but where there are, in, in addition to those small kind of construction activities, where there are also big, large projects going on, in, 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 going through this village, uh, the, the, the name where you can see here, the fast track and outer ring road, as I said before, and there is a transmission line and the Bagmati corridor project, a smart East project, is all big projects are going uh, through this settlement. So, so it, it's not only, you know, there are, the, Although there are different versions of you know um, saying how they the, these construction activities will impact, there are also some people say that it threatened local land and culture because it destroyed their agricultural practices, it destroyed uh, their their 
their cultural heritage sites and, and at the end they eventually they may displace the local people and but some people also say that it's quite natural uh, it's being a capital city uh, it's always grow and also it's come with some some opportunity uh, that uh, provide um, job and other business opportunity to local people so there are different versions well, this is the place, actual place where this study based, Coconut Village, which is uh, the ward number 21 of uh, one of the municipality, it's called Lalitpur Municipality. Well, uh, Katfundu Valley has three districts, Katfundu, Lalitpur, Bhaktapur, and Lalit, uh, Katfundu, and, uh, and uh, this is the one metropolitan city um, of Kafund Valley and the Kokona belong to ward number 21. It has 29 wards within the municipality. It's, a, it's ward number 21. I hope everyone is hearing me. Uh, uh, it has uh, two small villages called one uh, main coconut is, or is called Sano coconut. Sano is Nepali word. It, uh, uh, it means small, small, small coconut. And 90% um, uh, of population live in main coconut, uh, which is around uh, 0.2 square kilometer. In total, it's a 3.1, uh, 3.2 square kilometer, but uh, within 0 0.2 square kilometer, most population are living. And uh, most of them, more than 90% of people are, are Japu. Uh, Japu means farmer uh, in Nyawari language. And uh, with, the, with, with its our name, Dongol and Marjan, they do, uh, their main source of livelihood is, is farming. And there are also some people uh, with certain name Kapali, Kusle, Napit, and Sai. Those are, although they are not categorized locally Dalit, but their 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 status, social status, their position to local resources, um, local economic affair, and their landowner capacity, and the, the behavior between the uh, two group, uh, it's it's it, it exactly. Uh, same as uh, the government categorized Dalit to uh, um, other, uh, other, other, other other caste uh, community. Where well, Dalit actually uh, are those community who uh, used to uh, categorize as untouchable in the past, uh, which is illegal and punishable at the moment. Uh, these, they, these people are there around 4% people uh, are those categories. And there are other people around 3% which belong to uh, with this surname, Sesta, Thakuri, Tuladar, and Sakya, but these all are Newar community. It's, it, in general, it's called Nehar. There are different uh, social hierarchy and different group within this community. Well, you can see the photo. This, this, uh, the far. You see the main coconut village. And this is a new construction going on here, uh, and uh, um, this is the agricultural land. I have another map. I'll show you again. And these are the new place, uh, the new houses construct going on. This is the old coconut. You can see very small uh, lane and. Uh, which were risks during during earthquake and um, uh, other hazard. Uh, even we can't drive car inside uh, this area, uh, and the settlement is still very compact. Uh, this is the Google map. You can see the all coconut. If you remember this uh, uh, corner here, uh, you can see in the river here exactly. This is the Bagot River. Uh, it's meandering here, and this some little bit far from here. Uh, it's the last part where from where the coconut, I mean, the, from where the Bangladesh River go uh, toward the uh, southern part of Nepal. It's called Tarai, plain land of Nepal. And uh, this is the main coconut here, and the small coconut in the northern side, and this is the southern side, where 90% of population live and around 10% live here. This is the new coconut, I mean, construction pictures uh, are going on. These are primarily private houses and business uh, companies and the factories and, uh, and several things are going on. The whole land is changing now. Well, this used to be used to be Erika's land. And uh, and you can see the long line here. It's it's a dot road now, but uh, so far uh, we talk with uh, the, their local with people of local government. Uh, this, this is going to be blacked up within a couple of years, within two years, maybe due to um, lockdown, lockdown and COVID, it may, it may go a little bit further uh, uh, back. I mean, the, it takes for more, one more year, two more year uh, to finish, but uh, they will be, it will be uh, blacked up very soon. So this all land has already sold out by either local or by outsider. And th these all will be uh, covered by houses and facts very soon. Well, these are the very productive land of coconut, but uh, the all going to be, uh, you know, covered by houses and and then, and then other, other factories and other things. This is the place where government is planning to construct a huge bus park to 
uh, to link uh, to, to in the fast route. Uh, I have mapped to show you fast route later. And uh, from here, the, the bus will go throughout the city. And, uh, but there are lots of conflict and debate going on. And every year, uh, they have conflict here. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks, you will, you, will, you will hear a conflict concerning uh, this place uh, newspaper because they, 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 every year they go to uh, plant petty there. And but uh, the, the government and local security people do not allow them to do that because the government is, is the planning to construct a, a, a bus park here. And uh, this is the, the linking road to the coconut village. And uh, these all are, uh, are are land are already sold to outsider and the migrant people. And the, this actually this all part has already been sold out actually. And but uh, the houses are not constructed, but very soon you will see houses there. So you can see the, the map uh, this is the coconut again and uh, the, the index you can see this is the Bamodi corridor. Uh, a road going to be construct uh, is going to construct here, and this Kafundu Tarai Expressway is also it's also called a fast track, uh, which will be uh, this way. Well, the government has not, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean the uh, provide I mean give the uh, out recent uh, map of fast track, but uh, this will be somewhere here. It's not going to be uh, changed more, but uh, due to uh, conflict there, uh, we heard that the government may may. Uh, Little bit toward the riverside and uh, redu reducing the the uh, eric, I mean the destruction of agricultural land and uh, and uh, they have maybe gone maybe cross the river and maybe uh, the go then go to the this bus park area, and you can see the this um, touch line going to construct uh, the, uh, from the middle of the settlement. Uh, I mean the, also the this uh, the agricultural land. And the bus park, of course, of course, and the ring road is going to this way. I mean, this outer ring road, which has, which is, which is not constructed. I mean, it's on the way. Well, and again, going back to the Kokana, it's um, broadly, as I said, there are two broad category of people: one, the Dongol and Marzan, which are considered as the highest uh, caste community within Kokana. Although in the newer system, uh, the Dongol and Marzan are are probably in third category. But uh, it, 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 in Kokona, um, these uh, these two committee are as the dominant group and the highest car group who also hold most of the resources in uh, in terms of land and and also they lead local politics. They lead local Guti. Guti is a traditional organization that uh, that uh, every neighboring community have and uh, to celebrate uh, cultural and ritual practices. Mainly they are, they have two Guti. It's called the Jatra Guti festival Guti and uh, um, you know Malami Guti or funeral uh, the, uh, Guti to 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 practice those things. Another group is a Dalit group, although they don't say Dalit, but uh, they are they resemble Dalit in terms of their social positionality and, and economic status and access to politics. Uh, they don't have land, only very few people, they, uh, they, they own land, they depend entirely with the Guti land and and the land on, on Dongone more than they work there or some people give them to, to cultivate land, their land. But they cannot be a member of uh, Guti. Uh, I mean, the traditional organizations. They, but they, but they, pro they provide services. For instance, uh, Kapali. Uh, that's one community. They play music during festival and other 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 cultural activities there. And Napit community play. I mean, the court nail, Kusle. They are sweeper. Uh, traditionally, and aside, they sacrifice the uh, Hebrew and during festival for for Dumbo and Marzan. But they can't. They can't. They can't be a member uh, of the of 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 of. of, of, of Guti and local tradition institutions. So, uh, by doing uh, these kind of services to to Dangal Mahajan and and their, their Gutis, they will get some some support from uh, this community. They, this is how their uh, their livelihood uh, um, uh, run. And uh, also, uh, although there is, uh, it's quite uh, it's punishable and illegal. Um, uh, in term, I mean the uh, this on on this on this practice, but it exists there. Uh, people, some people told us uh, during interview they feel uh, kind of uh, untouchability during their everyday lesson and in everyday uh, practices uh, at local level. Well, in terms of rig governance, they have very good rig governance at local level, but uh, also, of course, in municipality, and they have a, a very um, I mean the uh, locally formed uh, group uh, disaster management group called Ward Disaster Management Committee or WDMC led by Ward Chair. Ward Chair is one elected member, a leader of the Ward. Uh, 
But the challenge that they have, they have no regular meeting and they have no kind of meeting, I mean, the agenda, what to discuss and what to do those, uh, uh, that committee. Um, uh, well, uh, some some say that uh, it's it's uh, it's due to the ward chair because ward chair have to lead. The, uh, I mean, the, the convene the meeting and they have the ward chair has to call the meeting. But uh, but he is very busy not only in community level but also he is busy in municipal activities and other activities and other political affairs. So he can't call he cannot call the meeting. So that's why also they don't have meeting. They, that also one component of, uh, of the respondent. But uh, but but uh, they. When we review the document, uh, but we can see that uh, the WMC can 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 restructure uh, their working work framework and uh, and transfer this right to any member of the WMC, but they haven't practiced that. Well, it's not very functional actually, but there is very weak. There is still no representation of the uh, community. Well, recently tomorrow cities and project LCS, we went there. We restructure the, this one uh, couple, uh, just two months uh, ago, but uh, it has just restructure technically. But how does it work? How it, it affect in local uh, local risk management? We don't know it. We have to see it. This paper will uh, during the production of this paper, we will see something uh, changes on it. And uh, but also we also notice that uh, members are not very much motivated. They are not trained, and uh, uh, they are not sure what to do the, with, with local risks, how to do, how to manage those things. And in in addition to that, uh, they don't they don't have kind of very a kind of regular coordination and meeting and uh, and the uh, knowledge sharing between municipality and ward and district and ward and this coordination sort of lack. Primarily, they lack risk management plan. They don't have what to do. They have some budget. Uh, they, they allocate budget every year. Uh, although it's not much, but they can do something with that budget. It, at least they can make a plan, but there is no plan for risk management at all. Well, we found four kind of uh, everyday risks, uh, which include both the natural and non-natural, I mean, social and other risks. Uh, well, uh, natural hazard is not, uh, actually it's not major risk there, but uh, uh, the earthquake, uh, uh, it, it's quite recent and which just, just destroyed more than 80% of houses in Kokana. Uh, it's considered, uh, I perceive as a, as one of major risks there, one of the risks, uh, but, but uh, in general, you know, other risks like landslide, flood, those are not the major challenges actually responded, do not take these are major risks. But, uh, you know, the, some land near uh, Bagmati river are, are sometimes at risk as exposed to landslide during monsoon season. But, uh, uh, they, 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 they take natural hazard as a, as a list risk uh, there by the people. Uh, well, fire is major hazard there. It's a quite quite compact and very small. Uh, in, uh, people are living in a small area. There is no uh, open spaces. And they have already faced uh, fire hazard three times, uh, and uh, they scared with that. It's quite uh, quite risky in terms of fire. Uh, although they have some, uh, they have uh, two years back they they installed this. Uh, uh, water water pump with hose in local uh, local um, river it's called Depuku there uh, uh, they also have some rescue uh, 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 and relief material but uh, there is no trained hum human resources uh, um, and and uh, uh, people are uh, the WMC member are not well trained to use those technology uh, it's it's uh, anyway uh, they have something there to to, to mitigate uh, fire hazard which is the major risk of, risk of Kokana. Uh, another well development, of course, development is a good thing for people. They are, they are, they are different, but you know, uh, the, some people consider it uh, it creates challenges in their agricultural land, their culture, uh, and it may it may it may bring uh, it may um, bring new challenges like uh, conflict with uh, migrants uh, who are not belong to uh, the local uh, belong to local uh, culture and. Um, uh, and practices, uh, these people are, do not understand local languages, and 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 maybe um, uh, that may be uh, that may cause in the future uh, conflict. Uh, although some also consider, as I said before, uh, that um, uh, this uh, uh, development project as as an opportunity, uh, considering it, um, especially uh, the those marginal people, uh, they said that uh, it, this may create some opportunity for us, so we can work and we can. Uh, have the rent our land or our houses so we can earn something. Uh, 
uh, well, uh, we are not, uh, we could not produce lots of uh, 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 crops from the land is youth are not very interested in Erika's land. Probably the, these construction activities and renting out their land or, or renting out their houses may give more money than, than getting uh, getting income from, from the production of land uh, where they lack labor and, and the other facilities. So these are few things are also going, on, but also major things are, they think that this project may displace them well, this, there are several large scale projects. Some of them are also considered as a national pride project and government definitely is going to do uh, implement those things. Uh, and in, uh, when implementing those things, so these people may uh, need to face some challenges, which is considered as, a, as another risk uh, in their everyday life. And the discussed hierarchy. Sorry, Dilly. Uh, just about maybe five more minutes. Try to uh, kind of bring it to a close. Uh, okay, thank you, Bobby. I'll try to finish. Five minutes. minutes. Have, okay, thank you, Bobby. Thank you. Well, uh, caste hierarchy, and there are two groups, as I said, one committee are actually uh, not resourceful. Um, they are not represented in local uh, government. They are not represented in local development activities and plan policy making. So uh, they are less They are less capable of responding to risks, and which are definitely are exposed to more risks uh, in tomorrow's city. Well, on the other hand, another group are, are um, are, are more powerful in terms of uh, economy, uh, political, and uh, local development affair. Uh, so this this balance also uh, may create conflict in the future, or maybe the, the local government has not uh, work how to harmonize this, how to how to uplift local livelihood of this community uh, to make them uh, uh, responsible. I mean, to make them uh, able to um, face future challenges. Well, it, uh, we have four major gaps. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly I'll tell. One, as I said, well, um, uh, well, local government are primarily, you know, they they, they don't focus uh, risk, uh, disaster risk reduction kind of activities, uh, and uh, they primarily focus on hardware. I mean, the, the uh, in a physical kind of uh, cost kind of development. You know, you can see the flow diagram. Um, uh, local government is led by elected member of political parties and they are elected there for five years and they want to do something visible to their 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 their, their people their voter and uh, if they invest lots of money on VRR uh, that people cannot see maybe that's a uh, they, they may that may not protect their kind of voting uh, you know uh, they may create risks uh, for the next time for, for in the next election so although they say that it's due to public demand we have to go to uh, hardware uh, well it's hardware and software are not might on their time Actually, well, it's, we know in computer world, but uh, it's also quite uh, used in, 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 in local level as well. Like hardware, they means uh, something visible kind of infrastructure like road, bridge, or hardware. And software are those which we can see, people can see, like uh, understanding these, researching risks, or uh, developing uh, uh, inventory, those kind of things, and giving training. These things where uh, this member don't want to invest lots of money. Well, this we, we, we found this gap, you know. Uh, Local government invests more on hardware, but less on, on the disaster external, which, which, which may be a problematic for the future, uh, uh, for, for, for tackling future risks. And second one, uh, due to this uh, urbanization and the influx of migrants, um, some people consider as a threat uh, to as a threat to local land and culture, which may create conflict uh, between old and new community in the future, uh, which is emerging, uh, which, which we can't see now, but maybe it, it's possible in the future. And definitely the exclusion of Dalit uh, and marginal group um, from um, local social uh, political affair and uh, local policy making process uh, definitely decrease their capacity to respond to future risks. And uh, yeah, and the final one is uh, not having a risk management plan and a disjoint relation between uh, the government within government uh, within the ward and the WDMC. I mean. The, Disaster Management Committee and the ward and the municipality. This also uh, the major gap we found. Uh, five, this is my final slide, Bobby. Uh, there are three risks we think the government can uh, um, look at, actually. The one uh, we call it insufficiently managed risks and ignored risks and unknown risks. Insufficiently managed risks are those which are already there, like um, respondent I and mean, the municipal respondent said that, uh, you know, uh, due to construction activities, uh, landslide is triggered by uh, on, ongoing construction activities in southern part of the, the valley. It's not only uh, due to uh, big development project, but also due to individual houses and real estate, you know, uh, but these are not well managed. It means 
I don't think they, it, it, it's due to the lack of budget. I mean, the, but it, it is a lack of focus on the local government because the local government want to put lots of money on something somewhere else, not in the disaster reduction and management. Uh, that's another one, one major thing that uh, one have to do. And the other one is ignore rates. That's uh, the, the socialism within the community, uh, which is, well, uh, this, this reason I question culture local level, which is really tough to handle, but uh, elected member and local government can think something to harmonize the community, to have harmonize relations, to uplift the livelihood of a marginal group, group you know, uh, uh, to make them uh, able to um, and tackle future risks. Uh, that's uh, that. These are these are ignored now. You know, in, in addition in addition to that, uh, this uh, not categorizing them as Dalit. Uh, that's uh, that's also referring them uh, from having uh, some provision, uh, uh, some quotas that government has allocated for those people. You know, they they you know it's it's local level government should have one representative from Dalit community. But in in in, in one or twenty one because they consider uh, marginal community are not Dalit. That's why there is no Dalit in in in, in representative in, in war in Kokona, which is almost not possible throughout the Nepal. And very maybe I, I haven't heard a this uh, kind this kind of uh, structure uh, throughout the Nepal because every ward must have one Dalit representative elected. That's a that's a mandatory constitutionally. But in in, in Dol, I mean in one or twenty one in Kokona, there is no representative because they are not categorized as Dalit. That's a that's a major gap. Government have to work or maybe. Uh, how to uh, maybe other way also they can address these risks. Another one is unknown risks. We don't know these risks. This may be due to this ongoing development project and the construction activities that are going on there, uh, which may create due to uh, I mean which may create a, a conflict. Look, I mean cultural conflict and maybe uh, this may create a competing actor to to harness the you know opportunity that may uh, that may come with those government projects. And uh, here the local government, I mean, the local risk management government can work uh, uh, how to, uh, you know, um, how to how to soften the, this potential risk. Uh, what, uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, 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 what mechanism they can develop to uh, to to ensure uh, some uh, some uh, possibility of earning uh, earning from redevelopment project uh, to local community and um, and how uh, uh, how they can um, uh, kind of uh, develop harmony between migrant and non uh, local people. So these things uh, these are these are sensitive issues, but local government, elected people, and the risk management committee they can think about. Um, from now, that's our gap we see. So we suggest local government to to conjointly work and think about uh, these these risks, uh, which may which will make people uh, able to respond uh, to more risks. Thank you so much. Sorry if I took long time. Okay, thank you very much, Dilly. Um, okay. And thanks to everyone for a really uh, interesting set of of, of papers. Um, we have a good chunk of time uh, in front of us, about half an hour or so. Uh, in which we can uh, just have a conversation <laughs> pretty much about some of the things that have been uh, discussed. Uh, I'd like to invite some reflections from the conveners, any thoughts that you might have on the papers, and just to open the floor more generally to everyone um, to ask questions uh, and talk about some of the things that may have been brought up during the course of, of the papers. We have a question here from uh, BJ in the chat. BJ, do you wanna, do you wanna jump in and uh, 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 ask your question to Barbara, please, if you're there. Is BJ there? <laughs> hi, hi, Bobby. Can you hi, hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear you long clear. Yeah, the net uh, the network is not so good, so it's keep on going. So, uh, thank you for for giving me this opportunity, and uh, I had actually uh, some query with to Barbara. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank her for the, the for her wonderful presentation. Uh, actually, I have two queries regarding the whole resettlement process. Like uh, I was wondering, uh, like she has been um, telling about this allied groups and the local leaders, but I actually want to know, uh, wondering what the actual role of those local leaders were, like who they are representing and what values uh, that do, uh, do, their decisions are influenced of. And uh, also like to know if there had been any instances during our whole uh, PSG process where the local leaders have actually expressed their Latin values rather than the resettlers values, if she has certain um, experience or the instances like that. And uh, also 
I was also wondering if uh, there were any instances of uh, negotiations between the resettling communities and the host communities. Normally, uh, like in our context, there has been a lot of negotiations between these uh, resettling communities and host communities. So uh, has he found certain instances where there has been such negotiating conditions? And under such, if there, is, there are any, uh, who and uh, how the resettlers were represented in those negotiations and uh, how they have been represented. So that was some of my curiosities regarding our project. Uh, thank you. Thanks, BJ. Um, should we take, um, should we just go one at a time then, perhaps? Okay. Barbara, your response? Yeah, hello. All right, yeah. Thank you for those comments and questions. Yeah, let me start with the, with, with the last one, which is the one that before I forget. Where you're saying there is there been a negotiation process between the, the settlers and the host community? The simple answer is no. But um as I said, the implementing partners, mostly the NGOs, they entrusted the local leaders of the flood zone areas to go and negotiate for land in the host community. So it was initially, it was a meeting between the local leaders, the government and the NGOs to discuss about the land where they should resettle. So out of that meeting, the government did not have land where to settle these people. So what they did was to ask the local leaders from the flood zone areas to go to the nearby uh, communities to ask if there is spare land for them to move with their people from the flood zone areas. So it was the local leaders from the flood plain areas who went to negotiate for land in the upper areas. And the government um, facilitated this process whereby the local leaders from both places they met to discuss about the possibilities of giving them land. But as we know, I'm sure it's everywhere in the globe, there is nobody's land. Land is scarce nowadays. And the, in the discussing about it, the land has their own it has owners. So instead of like the government bringing in or giving people land, sourcing land from somewhere else, the process was like to just give it to these local leaders to discuss on themselves. So after this negotiation process, the outcome, that's what the resettlement process is based on. So in one of the areas where I went to, after this process, the local leaders from the upper area, they said, if you want us to give you land to resettle, what we want is, it's a win-win situation. We need you to give us land in the lower area where you, we can be going to farm. Because the, uh, the lower land, as I said, is good for farming because of the, the floods itself. So each and every year when the floods come, it's a source of uh, fertile soil for farming. So the people up and said, okay, this is not a problem, but you come here, we'll give you land to settle, but the same amount of land if we give you 10 hectares, we would want 10 hectares in the lower land for me to give to my people there to farm. So the people who are about to resettle, they said no, because we want, we just want land to, to resettle, but we'll still maintain our land in the lower land for farming. As a result, the negotiation did not do anything. So in the process, these people, they said, if you are not trading in your land, then you're not coming to our land. So as I said, because of it is the decision of the allies from the, this meeting, they went back to, their, to, to the vulnerable people and told them that we don't have any land to get because these people, this is what they're saying. So in that community, that was the consensus of the community that we can't reset because we can't give us our land. But if 
the vulnerable people themselves were given an opportunity. We never know some people might want to say, okay, because here I'm always vulnerable, I might want to go up and depending on somebody's vulnerability. So that's how I, I can talk with the last one. So on the first one, like the resettlement process, what are the actual role of the leaders? So it's still coming in to this negotiation process that the local leaders are there to determine where should we move. So they, they are the first people that are able to evaluate how the resettlement process should be like. So if they negotiate the land, they have to choose that, okay, this is the land that we are going. If they agree with him, that's when the resettlement process was negotiated. And uh, about how, what would be the resettlement process? So the first case I presented, as I said, I went to four places. The other place, it was like the, uh, the local leaders, they accepted to move, but it was the same traditional authority or the same area. It was just from the lower area to the other place. So the local leaders, what they did was they selected some villages to go upland, but the traditional leader himself and his village that he was ruling, it was still in the lower land. So you can see there that it is uh, a process of to, to see which area has more advantages and which one has more disadvantages. So the local leader himself said, but in his saying, he said, it is because I'm so considerate, so I allowed these people to go first and I'll be the last. But initially, you can see there that it's not about that. If this land had all this, he would have been the first person to move to say, I'm giving out as a good example of this resettlement process. But because after evaluating that this area is dry and there's nothing that I can benefit, say, okay, few communities you can go first and I'll follow later when more land is there. So, but in, if you dig, uh, we, we dig deeper, is that there is no policies in place for resettlement. So it's like the resettlement is being implemented in a haphazard way. Just taking, if, if an NGO comes and says, I have money and I want to resettle this, so the government will just facilitate the process and take in the guidelines of that NGO. So if two or three NGOs come and we all know that um, these private are partners, they have different, different policies and procedures on how they implement their project. So the third place that I went to, there are four NGOs that are there trying to settle the same community, but different implementation plans are in place. So the guideline, I mean, the bottom line is that because the Malawi government doesn't have a national policy for resettlement. It's just haphazard when there are floods. Let's move the people. Then after the flooding, it's like this time around, it's not the rainy season. You cannot hear about this uh, plans of moving the people. But during the rainy season, when people, they are about uh, flooding are there, that's what they say. Let's move the people, let's resettle the people. So you can see that it's because of lack of planning policies. I hope I've answered have answered most of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Um, Noon, did you want to jump in there with a question or comment? Thank you, Bobby. Um, also, we we'll want to thank Barbara for for the presentations. I have some some comments and and also the questions to share. First of all, I, I did some some studies on the resettlement as well, and we'd we'll like to share that in. Um, my case studies may in in many cases uh, the resettlers uh, lose their land rights after resettlements, and I think what happened in 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 your case study, I think it's it's, it's nice that you have some sort of uh, a form of negotiation that they can maintain um, that their land ownership there. Uh, and I would like to to follow up uh, BJ's uh, questions on, on the role of of the leads. Um, because if I understand you correctly, uh, the elites also include uh, the NGOs in in their in the case study as well, and and I'm wondering if you can expand on, on that a little bit of, of the role of, of the NGOs, and is it similar to uh, local leaders or 
or they, they have different roles in, in the, these kind of uh, dynamic process. Thanks. Thank you, Naomi. All right, yeah. Okay. Should I talk about that? Yes, please. Okay, all right. Yeah, thank you so much, Kamin. And um, yeah, it would be good yeah, to, to share, like you said, you're also doing some studies in settlement. So in this case study, the role of the NGO was, first of all, to provide funding for the, the settlement program to, uh, to be in place. And the secondly, as when they go in the process, it, some NGOs was to, for land identification. In one of the case studies that I went to, the case, um, the one of the NGOs which is the Red Cross, they already identified the land. They made, they did the negotiation of land process. And they, after identifying the land, it was now the time to resettle. But there again, there were some issues because the land that was found there, it was just to enough for 50 households out of a um, thousand from that community. So the community is there. They also said, so we are a thousand households here. So whom are you going to choose out of the 50 households? So as a result, we are not moving because we want to move as a group. So another role of also the NGO was also to, um, to facilitate the process of identifying the actual individuals since this was now targeted. So to identify the individuals that needs to go upland. And the, most, of it, most of the NGOs uh, that were implementing the settlement and this particular site that I went to, they were mainly um, identifying like the orphans, but also the elderly, those people that maybe because of flooding, they cannot be able uh, to move in time. So, but also in this identification process, there are also some issues because the old elderly were saying that I'm old, I cannot fetch for myself, and I cannot be able to be commuting from this area that I'm going to the lower land because most of these sites were like the other eight kilometers away or the farthest was 15 kilometers away, but people, they were still wanted to maintain the lower land for farming. So uh, people said, okay, if you are identifying just one person in a household in the order, how am I going to be maintaining my livelihood sources? So there were issues as well there, and people, that's when they are coming in that we want to move as a group or as a family. And the, some roles of the NHOs was also to see some people, they also, NHOs, like um, there was international labor of migration, they built some houses for 70 households in, the, in one of the resettlement sites. So the, the roles, they, they were differing according to the NHO, as I said, it just depends on which package they were bringing. If they, are, they didn't have land purchasing in their programming, it means they were just uh, there to identify the household and to facilitate the moving process. But other NGOs, they were there, they were building houses like the International Labor of Migration. What they did was just to build these houses, there were 70 houses, and the rest of the process was left to the traditional leaders to choose who should occupy these, um, who could occupy those houses that they have built. And also, they were also bringing in the people to build these houses. So you could see there that the communities, they are like, we, are, we have some of the local artisans in this community, but the NGO we are bringing in already uh, because of their process, they said we cannot give this to the community, but we will have our own people, five suppliers who are our builders when we are building houses. So they had, the NGOs had varying laws depending on 
what they have to offer in the resettlement process. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bravo. Um, Thanks very much. Are there any other um, any other questions, comments from the floor? Otherwise, I might uh, maybe invite uh, Nimesh. I think he has written a, a comment here. Perhaps you might want to direct it to uh, to Barbara Nimesh. No, I think it's just uh, more of a common question, and I, I just I, I'm pretty sure she's already familiar with that literature. But just wanted to, uh, as she was talking, um, it reminded me of David Lewis and um, David Moore's work on brokers and translators, and I thought that because I think what you're doing is is really uh, at least I haven't read anything about like um, the role of elites in um, disaster risk governance and resettlement. And I think what you're doing, it sounds really novel, uh, but perhaps there may be a way you can, uh, you know, you can use this to frame in which how they negotiate like everyday forms of risk and resettlement. Um, so I think that was more of a comment, but if I may, I, I had a couple of questions for um, Anusha and uh, Dilly, if I can, um, can, I, can I go ahead, Bobby? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, sure, <laughs> that uh well first of all it's really good to uh, have this opportunity to respect um, Delhi and Anusha because I also work in from Nepal and do work on in Nepal and I, I have read their work so thanks to the panel organizers for that uh, for this opportunity to connect uh I think when Anusha's presentation what I I thought was I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the the uh, influence of 2015 earthquake on the, how this whole idea of informality, how the state, and which goes back to our yesterday's um, Arabella's comment on seeing the st state versus seeing like a state, you know, how the state is um, viewing informality. But I, at least from my research, I thought like there's also been substantive uh, changes in which how citizens see the state, right? So informal, like how particularly people living, living in disaster prone areas. Um, plus there has also been, uh, I guess, other major critical events in the past few years, including the 2017, uh, which Dilizi talked about um, uh, the local elections. And that happened after a gap of like two decades and that, uh, may have had some impact on how local communities interact with the local government. Uh, so I was wondering like what's what's where is where does the the earthquake fit in in this um, in this uh, uh, idea of informality and I guess uh, my second question is to Dili uh, because uh, when we think about Kokana I was um, it always comes uh, to at least for me the the fast track which you briefly mentioned about and how that has led to uh, protest and um, um, of which we hear it happens and which is very important when we think about political capability, I guess, because how people voice and how um, against this uh, increasingly infrastructure led development in Nepal and I guess turn to hardware, which you mentioned like hardware based development. And so that really didn't come uh, maybe beyond the scope of this particular paper, but uh, where does that come in, like people protesting against that particular project um, and uh, about undue, uh, unfair compensation, risk of displacement, uh, and also like our broader understanding of risk um, and disaster. So I was wondering if, if it is part of the investigation or maybe doing it separately beyond this, uh, which came like slightly the fast track, but uh, if you could speak to that. So, but thanks, thanks so much for um, really interesting presentations. Thanks, Namesh. Uh, Dilia or Anusha, would you like to respond to this? Let's start, Bobby. Namaste, Namaste. Thank you for your question and thank you for your Namaste. I, I, I was most, most tempted to ask my question in Nepali, but I refer from her. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, because we have an international group, let's communicate in English. Uh, regarding your question about 2015 earthquake, first we need to understand that there are two categories, Sobasi and Sukumbasi. What we are referring to here as so, it's, it's not Sobasi who are prominently affected during the earthquake because of uh, the damages it caused, but we are referring to Sukumbasi, the other group where they are largely vulnerable to flooding. 
rather than the earthquake. So it's largely that group because of the lack of tenure security, lack of land title. Regarding with Subasi, they also do not have the land title, but because they are traditional settlers, government has established formal mechanism to address their insecurity. So they, the land can be sold to formal processes. So, so it's, it's largely Subasi whom, whom as per our information, because we interacted with a couple of groups, also the federation for them the major natural risk this risk in terms of uh, affecting their settlement the habitat is flooding rather than earthquake so i i think we, we at least we didn't find any group directly affected by earthquake until now and about the election of 2017 it's very interesting to know that uh, they all have they do not have land title many of them also do not have migration yet but they have voting cards so because of that, uh, they voted, and that is a very strong power. They have been mobilizing to gain, gain uh, to advocate for their rights. And interestingly, they are not affiliated to a particular party, but they have links, well-established links, to multiple parties. So they ex explicitly explain that we do not bother if the, if the ruling party changes because we have strong link with multiple parties. So we find it it's very strategic action to continue maintaining their power position. So do not formal but at least getting protection against eviction and all the formal actions. And, and also, I think, voting cards, even tips, multiple parties. Did I miss any other points? Sorry if I missed it. No, thanks. I think that was great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nimeji. It was a, a great question. Uh, I'm quite, uh, you know, actually, we are all aware of those things. These are the, this, this is the reason why we are there actually. But you know the uh, due, due to time constant and also the, the you know the focus of the paper is not directly on those protests and the exactly one particular kind of uh, construction uh, you know uh, project there. There are several, not only fast tags. So there are five. I told you. I, I mentioned the presentation. So there are five huge projects that are going on simultaneously. You know, fast track is getting uh, uh, getting you know lots of attention by uh, many people, but also you know the uh, transmission lines are going just above the houses there. We, we have observed there, you know, and also if government construct these uh, uh, corridors and uh, and 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 uh, the outer ring road, this is going to definitely destroy uh, you know lots of agriculture and uh, and. Uh, you know, residential area there, and either they have to move. So these things are there. We, we are quite aware, and uh, and uh, of course uh, these things we can't uh, bring everything in one paper. But uh, uh, this will be uh, well, we'll report it either published in some way. We have we have reported already these things, but uh, we are also thinking to, you know. Uh, do uh, make several papers uh, uh, from from the from, from our involvement there. And also the other reason is that it, it's quite uh, you know um, challenging for researchers as well to raise this issue, this issue there. You know the government consider this project as a development and national national pride project, and you know they want to do anyway. You know Nepal Army was mobilized to construct fast track. You know that you know Nepal Army. You know they they are they are there with gun and uh, bullet and everything. They are they are constructing the road now. You know, it's quite contentious. Every year, maybe you know, I, as I mentioned before, in, maybe in a couple of weeks you will hear the conflict in Kokana because uh, the zero point where the government going to construct a bus park to uh, you know to to link uh, the, throughout the city. Uh, there, uh, local people go to plan pedi in terms of you know uh, that kind of uh, uh, showing their uh, um, disinterest over. Uh, that's uh, uh, symbolizing their protest against the, the, the government project, you know, uh, their conflict. It's, it's also challenging for researchers to, to raise this issue there. And, and also there are uh, two groups actually, you know, uh, honestly, you know, the, uh, several people have already received some competition from the government. Uh, some are also politicizing the, the issue, you know, the, it's also kind of a moment to get uh, the government attention and, uh, and uh, get recognized, um, I mean, to get some power in local politics also. And also, you know, some village, actually the, the Sano Kokana, I mentioned the small one where 10% uh, where, uh, people live and where actually uh, the bus, uh, the settlement is quite near from the bus park. Actually. These people are not very against the fast track, actually. They said, that's good because when this, uh, this will be constructed, we'll get more job, we'll get more business here. 
and the, the reason was actually the land uh, where the, the zero point uh, in the where bus park will be constructed actually belong to the people from the Tulu Kogan, I mean the, the main Kogan, you know, those kind of controls will also uh, there. And these things are quite challenging, challenging to, to bring uh, and to publish. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are, we are trying to find the midway and uh, see how um, uh, ethically we can do these things. And uh, of, of course, uh, the respecting local people voices since we are raising, we are doing ethnographic research that talk about uh, to, to follow what people say. And, uh, and, uh, and we, are, we, are, we have to hear local voices and, and we have to suggest how this can be addressed by local government. And, this is the place where we are playing. This paper is the is kind of uh, is kind of uh, 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 a plan to kind of take out uh, um, the bees to find these gaps and uh, uh, to provide some suggestions to local government where uh, this gap can be minimized or maybe addressed to some extent. Did I address your question correctly, Nimesi? Thanks. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I guess there's no. Thank you for the right uh, question or answer, but I think that was very really, uh, interesting. But I, I fully understand this is beyond the scope. But I guess maybe because we were yesterday also we were talking about cascading and intersecting disaster, and um, maybe there is some way we can you know yeah. bring this together. In, so I, but thanks so much. Thank you, Dilly, and thanks so much for this, um, uh, those kind of comments and questions. Um, I'm just conscious that we're uh, close to to out of time, and I do want to. Kind of invite some closing remarks from Richard. Um, I, I know Noom, you had a you had a question, uh, but perhaps if if it's interconnected, we can bring it up in, in the final session this afternoon. Is that okay? No worry at all, Bobby. Okay. All right. So um, just with a couple minutes left, uh, Richard, if if you'd like to kind of jump in with any closing thoughts, thanks. Right. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's so much to sort of pull out of this discussion. I do hope we can carry on into the, uh, the third session this afternoon. I mean, um, I don't want to sort of maybe go over, not go over what has been said before, but I think something that uh, strikes me from these uh, presentations today is how uh, disasters and risk uh, creates new sort of uh, political space. And you know, the sort of the state intervention around disasters and risk uh, can be seen as sort of uh, political capital in the way that we used to look at development projects as a form of capital. And I think this, you know, is a, a reconfiguring of those kinds of uh, spaces and uh, relations. So I think that's, that's worth exploring a bit further, uh, particularly as we look at different kinds of from the sort of everyday risk to the specific events and how these are interconnected. And as we said today, how uh, uh, impacts can cascade beyond particular people and uh, locations. Um, so that was something that, you know, struck me uh, in particular. And I think um, there's something, so one of the, the things that uh, Anusha, she finished on and we didn't really talk about very much, I think it was your last bullet point, is how, uh, around uh, informality, how politicians don't want to solve informality, they want to do politics on it. And I think that's a really, it's a really nice way of summarizing a lot of these complexities. And it says a lot about informality, but it also says a lot about risk as well, uh, and uncertainty. And I think, you know, it's, it's a really, uh, it's, it's a sort of a theme that cut across all three presentations today, and speaks very clearly to our framing around political capabilities. And I see John has a, a, a comment. Perhaps you want to speak up. Well, yeah, I would just, just when I was reflecting on the, the three presentations, I, I suspect we're going to go over our time here, but um, but very quickly, the, 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 like Anusha kicked us off with talking kind of explicitly about authentic, authenticity uh, and, and um, kind of setting authenticity up as a, a, as a, as a problem for us to, to, to kind of grapple with. And then as we went through the two presentations, this seemed to come through as well in terms of, you know, who are, who are the authentic voices, who gets, um, whose voice gets recognized as legitimate or, or authentic in, in processes of 
planning or disaster risk management or, re or re relocation. Um, obviously, in relation to um, the, the elites that, um, that Barbara was referring to, the, there's, a, there's a recognition by others of uh, the, the, the authenticity of the, the, the voices of the elite and the legitimacy of them as representatives of the community. And in, in Dilly's case, we've got uh, a, a kind of a, a, a number of, of, of kind of points of contestation between migrant, set, migrant and, and settled populations, between the, the settled population of Kakartner and, and, and the government, between the Dalits and, and pretty much everybody else, and who, whose voice wins out and is recognised and is heard in, in those debates, um, in, 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 in conflicts between the interests that are, that are, that are, that are held by those different groups. Um, it comes co comes down to to a question of um, or, or it play it play plays strongly into their political capability, right? So who who has the the authentic the authentic voice here? And it brings us back a little bit to the last session yesterday, where we started talking about um, <clears throat> about recognition and recognition justice, and kind of just directs us towards thinking about disaggregating communities. Um, to understand and acknowledge the, the complexity of the socio-political setting within which each of these examples are playing out and how each setting is rooted in, I'd say, kind of complex social-political um, kind of environments that are rooted in historical processes of identity creation. And those processes of identity creation then play out in Whose voices gets heard and, and deemed as legitimate in these in these different examples. So the question that, that Anusha started off with on, on authenticity, I just felt kind of played out through those other those other examples in, in that way. Okay, yeah, thanks, John, and thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, we're just banging out of time here, but hopefully we can carry on some of these conversations in the last session this afternoon at uh, quarter past two. It's sure to be a uh, sure to be a good one so um please join us if you can this afternoon and um yeah thanks again to everyone for their really interesting papers and for their um uh comments and questions uh during the course of today or this morning and yeah, thank thank you. You. yeah i'd like to thank you everyone bobby for good uh, coordination and uh, john richard and everyone for comment and initially for very good thought probable comment uh, on the paper we are working with uh, I really enjoyed it and thanks for all the participants uh, to, to listen to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.